We just have to say that uh, Secretary Perry is speaking right on time, and everybody quickly gets to their seats. Um, that was a fabulous panel, so thank you to the last panelists. Um, it was very moving to hear about the legacies of the American families from the Korean War. We're now shifting to our next keynote speaker, who is William Perry, who served as Secretary of Defense from 1994 to 1997 under President Clinton, where he presided over the dismantling of more than 8,000 nuclear weapons including, of course, the no small feat of helping to secure the freeze of North Korea's nuclear program for eight long years. Not only did the agreed framework, which he helped negotiate, avert a catastrophic war, U.S. nuclear experts estimate that in those eight years, North Korea could have produced enough plutonium to build 50 nuclear bombs a year. Dr. Perry is currently the Michael and Barbara Barbarian Professor Emeritus at Stanford University, and he has dedicated his life to eliminating the danger of nuclear weapons through his educational foundation, the Perry Project. Last December, I had the good fortune of spending the afternoon with Secretary Perry, and as I waited to meet him in an, an Encina Hall at Stanford University, I read with heaviness his memoir, My Journey at the Nuclear Brink, about how close the United States was to securing a non-aggression pact with North Korea. And as Bruce Cummings eloquently explained, how in 2000, President Clinton hosted in the Oval Office Vice, Vice Marshal Jo myung rook the second in command to North Korean leader Kim Jong-il. Well, in his memoir, he wrote that in that October evening, Secretary of State Madeleine Albright held a banquet for Marshal Jo, which happened to coincide with Secretary Perry's birthday. This is what he wrote. The warm feeling in the room that night, along with the developments of the previous year, made us all hopeful that the threat of a nuclear North Korea was behind us." End quote. Alas, President Clinton only had three months left, and well, the rest is an unfortunate history, as the agreed framework be eventually became unraveled. I could hardly contain my tears when I met Secretary Perry. He was the closest living embodiment of a peace agreement. As Professor Cummings noted, a non-aggression pact and a missile deal with North Korea that would have ended six decades of war. 17 years later, here we are again. We have a pro-engagement South Korean president and a Republican president that has come dangerously close to war with North Korea. Without further ado, let's hear from Secretary Perry on what we can and must do to avert nuclear war and bring peace to the Korean Peninsula. I have given many formal speeches on North Korea, but this is not going to be one of them. What I'm going to do today is you just share my thoughts. And it will be a little rambling in, in this, perhaps, but they will be from the heart. I'm going to tell you about a little bit about my history of North Korea. I'm going to tell you what my beliefs are, and finally what my judgments are, based on those beliefs. You've already heard of some part of my history, but let me start where it began with me. When I was Secretary of Defense, the first crisis, the first crisis I faced was with North Korea, of course. And we almost came to war in 1990. We were very, very close to war, closer than most of you probably appreciate. But we avoided it. I left office in 97, and then two years later, President Clinton called me to get back temporarily, specifically to deal with a new crisis with North Korea. First crisis having ended with the Greek framework. But the Greek framework was holding for nuclear, but it was not holding for net missiles. They were now building long-range missiles. And the Congress and the Diet, the Japanese Diet, were both threatening to scuttle the Greek framework. So the president asked me to, 
take a leave from Stanford and work with him for a couple of months as an envoy to North Korea, which I did. That led to what had been called, in Korea at least, the Perry Process. And I'm not going to talk much about that except to say that started off with the belief that we understood North Korea's problems and could deal with them. <coughs> and to deal with them, I had to work as equal partners with South Korea and with Japan. I could, the United States could not do it alone. That's what characterized the so-called Perry Process. The catchphrase, which I still use, and I still believe, is we have to deal with North Korea as it is and not as we wish it to be. We have violated that catchphrase for the last few decades <coughs> with terrible consequences. One other part of the history which is a minor part, but to me, to me seemed important. In 2006, the North Koreans invited the New York Philharmonic to play in Pyongyang. <coughs> And they invited leaders of the U.S. government to attend it, and they invited me to attend. I was out of government by then. It happened to coincide within a day or two of the inauguration of the South Korean president, which I had already agreed to attend. So I had to cable back to them that I was not able to go because I was going to be in North Korea the day before, South Korea the day before. And the transportation mode for getting from South Korea North Korea involved going to China. It's a long, complicated place. It just wasn't time to do it. And so they came back to me and said, well, we'll take you there. We'll drive you across the DMZ. Oh, that was interesting. <laughs> so I said, yes. And at the point of time, I showed up at the southern part of the DMZ. And there was a delegation waiting for me on the other side of the DMZ. And the South Korean and American troops ushered me to the line and then watched me walk over it, greeting some stern-looking North Korean colonel at the other end. Very stern-looking. <laughs> and we, I began to wonder whether this was such a good idea. <laughs> and we walked into his quarters, and the stern-looking boy only broke into a smile. He said, how happy he was to see me. And then he said, in, in a poor attempt at the North Korean joke, he said, he offered me some ginseng, and he said, you should not, perhaps I shouldn't offer you this because you don't have your wife with you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a ninja, the only Korean oh. understands <laughs> <laughs> the Ginseng is supposed to have aphrodisiac powers. <laughs> and then they had a Mercedes waiting to drive me to North Korea. Uh, and I got in and noticed it had been snowing the night before. There were a couple of inches of snow on the ground. I said, how are you going to deal with the, the snow on the road? He said, we'll have a, we have a snow removal team to take it off. And as we drove up to North, this is a big wide highway. There wasn't another car on the highway, the whole way to Pyongyang. We were the only car. And the snow removal team turned out to be thousands of peasants out with brooms and shovels sweeping off the road so our car could get to Pyongyang. They really wanted me to get to Pyongyang, it seemed like. <laughs> uh, the symphony itself was just beautiful. I'll never forget that evening. Pyongyang Symphony, of course, is a marvelous symphony, and they played, and they played beautifully. But the first thing that I struck me when I walked in the hall was a Korean flag on one side and an American flag on the other side. I thought that was pretty neat. And then they played the Korean anthem, and then they played the Star Spangled Banner. Everybody, everybody stood up for the Star Spangled Banner, which I thought was nice also. It was a very touching and very moving performance. The last number they chose to play was a Korean folk song. I forgot the name now, some of you may remember the name of it. But it had to, yes, it, it, had, to, it had to do with um, a lost lovers who were wanting to be reunited, sort of very symbolic. And as I was sitting there looking around during the playing that music, 
literally not a dry eye in the place. Here are these hardened <coughs> North Korean generals with little tears trickling down their eyes. Very moving moment. And then finally, when the orchestra was finished, the entire hall spontaneously stood in a standing ovation. I've seen standing ovations before, but that one lasted for 20 minutes. Not until the last orchestra member had left the stage did they sit down. I thought this might be a turning point, really. They had some reason for doing this. I'm not sure what the reason was, but it had to do with the gesture, I think. As it turned out, I was the only American official that attended that. Nobody in the government at that time attended. The evening before, at the inauguration, I talked with Condi Rice and said, told her what I was doing, said, are you going? She said, well, I was invited, but I'm not going. I said, why not? You're right here. <coughs> she said, well, it's only a musical performance. It was no more only a musical performance than the Chinese opening several decades before had been just about ping pong. This was really intended, I think, as some sort of an opening, which was met one week later by imp imposition of new sanctions, and so the whole thing. From that point on, it's been all downhill. I'll never know, but I've always believed that was our last chance to really do something meaningful in the North. So that's my history. What are my beliefs? Now, first and most importantly, the North Korean regime is not crazy. It's not irrational. That's been stated most recently by an ambassador to the UN. They're just getting it wrong. They're badly underestimating this country. For the last few decades, the dozens of Stalinist regimes that exist in the world have one by one disappeared, but not North Korea. It's the last man standing, the last nation standing. They're doing something right by their standards. They are not irrational. They're very shrewd. They're ruthless, they're reckless, but they're not crazy. They have a set of goals, a set of beliefs. And in my various meetings of them, I have induced what they are. I may be wrong, but I have to strongly believe that I'm right. And the first and foremost among the goals is the sustaining of the Kim dynasty. Some people call it preservation of the regime, but they think of it as a preservation of the Kim dynasty. They have a secondary goal, and that is to gain international respect. And the third goal is improve their economy. As they've demonstrated over and over again that that third goal is subsidiary to the first two goals. They will sacrifice their economy however necessary in order to achieve the sustaining of the regime. That's what I believe in soft terms. This is about hard terms. What do they have? What are they threatening us with? They have, without doubt, a modest size arsenal of nuclear weapons. People argue about the number. My guess is 15 or 20, enough to cause a lot of damage. And the building more and the building them at an increasing rate. They're using this arsenal for their international objectives. And they're using the secret police for their internal objectives, for keeping their people in line. And both of these have been very effective. They also are building ballistic missiles. They have a long, large arsenal of small range and medium range ballistic missiles, already operational. And they're working feverishly to build an ICBM, which in my judgment is probably a few years 
away yet. They've had problems on the way to getting to their ICBM. Some news accounts attribute some of those problems to the U.S. manipulating with their testing. Whether or not that's true, whether or not it continues to be true, I believe they will in time get to their ICBM objective. It's just a matter of when, not whether. So those were, that's what I believe about the situation. Now let me give you my judgments based on those beliefs. My first, in some ways, the most important judgment is they will not use their nuclear weapons in an unprovoked attack. They will threaten to do that. And it's a country which is very big on bluster. They're not blustering that they have the nuclear weapons, but they're blustering that they will use them. The nuclear weapons are and will continue to be very, very valuable to achieving their objectives. But they are only valuable if they do not use them. The first use they make of a nuclear weapon will lead to death to the leadership and devastation of their country, and they understand that. I'm not saying there's nuclear arsenal are not dangerous. I think it's very dangerous. But it's not dangerous in that way. They're not planning to launch an attack on Seoul or Tokyo or when they get long range missiles on the United States. Second judgment. If we conduct an unprovoked military action against North Korea, a preemptive strike of some sort. They will respond with military action, and it will be against South Korea. How, I cannot forecast. I know how they can do it. I don't know how they will do it. They have many, many hundreds of artillery weapons just north of the DMZ capable of reaching Seoul. So they could sit there and lob artillery shells, <coughs> thousands of artillery shells into school. That would be one way they could respond. They have special operational forces designed to land behind lines and wreak havoc. They might do that. They're not going to use their nuclear weapons, but they will do all these other ways. They have all these other ways of creating havoc. Uh, third judgment is I think there is a window for negotiation. In fact, a very promising window, I think, for a variety of reasons. Now, it takes a real leap of faith to say that because our negotiations for the last few decades, the last 17 years, have been miserable failures. We keep saying we'd like to restart the six-party talks. Why do we want to restart six-party talks? What's the product of the six-party talks? Six-party talks were set up to keep North Korea from getting nuclear weapons. And after a dozen years or so of six-party talks, they now have a nuclear arsenal. They have obviously have failed. Not because it was the wrong venue, not because it was the wrong people talking. The idea of those six nations coming together is a perfectly good idea is we never had a negotiating strategy that made any sense. Neither the Bush administration nor the Obama administration. So if we're going to talk again, if we're going to negotiate again, for heaven's sakes, we need to have a strategy for what we're going to say and what we're trying to accomplish, a strategy that has some chance of success. Diplomatic strategies are sometimes measured And what you're offering, and you're offering come in two categories, what diplomats call carrots and what they call sticks. You could call them incentives and disincentives. We, we, the United States, Japan, and South Korea, have lots of carrots, economic incentives in particular. It's my considered judgment that today, economic incentives are not sufficient to cause North Korea to give up their nuclear weapons. 
They have them and they like them. They think they've gained them a great advantage. It's gained them, as they see it, security, number one objective, preserving the regime, and it's given international respect. So it's given them their first two objectives. It's at the expense of the third objective, the economy. So any negotiation of them has to some way preserve their security and the respect, but give them the third one as well, its economic incentive. And also, if you're going to go back to negotiate again, you need to have some disincentives, some reason, something to get their attention. The only disincentive we have is threatening to go to war with them, which I must say has not been a credible. And they don't believe we're going to do that. They rightly do not believe we're going to do that. The only country that really has a disincentive is China. China's providing food, providing fuel, which is essential. If they cut off that food and fuel, that's a huge disincentive. American administrations have been years been arguing with China to do that, and China's refused. So what makes me optimistic that there's an opening for diplomacy now? I believe we should be saying to China, as we're now saying, you solve the problem. They're not going to do that. What we should do is go to China and say, Let's you and we be partners, solve this together. We will offer the following incentives, you will offer the following disincentives, we'll agree on what we're asking them to do, and we will pledge to you that our goal is not destabilizing and overthrowing the Kim regime, because China will not join us if that's the goal. And they have believed, I think quite correctly, during the Bush administration, that that was the, not, the, not only the goal, but the stated goal. If we could do that, if we could put together a diplomatic strategy which involved teaming with China, which involved offering incentives and disincentives, and which offered security assurances, not the overthrowing of the regime, I think we would have a chance of success. What would the success be? What would it look like? What would the goals be? When I negotiated with them in 1999, it was giving up their nuclear weapons. But remember, in 1999, they didn't have any nuclear weapons. Now they do. Now they have an arsenal. So it's a different price we're looking at now. I don't believe it's reasonable to expect that they will give up their nuclear weapons at this time. So I think the most ambitious goal we can have is a freeze on all of the testing, the nuclear testing and the missile, long-range missile testing. I think there's a shot at getting that. That is a goal in and of itself worth having. The nuclear testing program, I'm quite confident, will within a few years be testing hydrogen weapons. So it's a major incremental leap beyond where they are now. And the goal of the missile testing in a few years will be achieved, long range, namely ICBMs, and that's an incremental leap from where they are now. So it's a goal worth achieving in and of itself. But it's also a platform from which we might be able to negotiate a rollback. I would not expect to make that as an initial objective, but I would keep it in mind as a longer term objective. So if we were successful in this, we would achieve two goals. The first goal is greatly reducing the danger of the present situation, and secondly, creating a platform from which we might be able to roll back the nuclear program. But more importantly, we create an intangible goal, namely creating a dialogue between the North and South, creating an environment in which the North sees its possibility of becoming a, a normal nation without having to threaten other countries. That's ambitious. It's putting a lot of ifs together. 
but it's worth trying. Will we try it? I don't think so. I'm sorry to say. But it's good to have an existence theorem to understand that this is something we could do if we could only screw up our courage and screw up our confidence to do it. And that's the message I leave you today. A peace agreement, I believe, is possible and worth having if we will only decide we want to do it. Thank you.